welcome to another video from the Fisherman's Net and Saints Peter and Paul in Naperville, Illinois. In this series of videos, we've been looking at that central mystery of the Christian faith, that God is a trinity. And in our last video, we looked at the divinity of the Son, that the Son, Christ, is as much God as the Father is. And that was defined at the Council of Nicaea in 325. After certain challenges to the divinity of Christ, the church gathered in council and defined that and excluded the other options. So we saw kind of the role of the councils in defining matters of belief for Christians. Well, that Council of Nicaea said quite a bit about the Son, because that was what was being challenged. We heard that the Son was consubstantial with the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. But at the Council of Nicaea in 325, uh, not much was said about the Holy Spirit. In fact, all the Council of Nicaea said in its creed about the Holy Spirit was, and the Holy Spirit. And so that left kind of a vacuum. It left room open for yet another group uh, within the church to challenge now the divinity of the Holy Spirit. So we're still really in the, the fourth century, uh, kind of the middle of the 300s, when these challenges to the full divinity of the Holy Spirit arose within the church. And we have to look and say, well, what is revealed about the divinity of the Holy Spirit uh, in, in Revelation, in Scripture? And one of the first things we'll notice, really, is that there's no explicit claim in the Scriptures that the Holy Spirit is God. That is, you're not going to find a verse anywhere in the Bible that says, the Holy Spirit is God. Now, in the Old Testament, there are kind of uh, foreshadowings or hints at it, um, it talks about the Spirit of God, but really not the Holy Spirit uh, as a distinct person. More of, um, uh, it would be considered that the, the Spirit of God in the Old Testament was more of a divine attribute, um, but not necessarily a distinct divine person. And really this revelation of God as Trinity was gradual, right? In the Old Testament, we have the Father proclaimed clearly, and the divinity of the Son is, in the Old Testament, kind of hinted at or foreshadowed. Uh, in the New Testament, the divinity of the Son is fully revealed, and the Holy Spirit still lies in a bit of obscurity, at least until we get to the age of the Church. So you find no verse that says, the Holy Spirit is God, or God the Holy Spirit. Uh, what you do find are things like, well, Christ, who claims himself to be God, who says, I, uh, the Father, and I are one, and takes on the divine name, that same Christ promises, at the Last Supper, for instance, to send another. He promises that when he's gone, he'll send another paraclete. Uh, that word paraclete comes from the Greek, and it means, uh, in English we render it, advocate, or sometimes consoler. So Christ promises to send another. Um, so this is a, a hint at the divinity, the, the, the personhood of the Holy Spirit. We do get very close uh, to uh, uh, a verse that says that the Holy Spirit is God, but not quite explicitly. In Acts chapter 5, Peter says to Ananias, and you can go and read the chapter yourself to get the whole context, he says, Ananias, you have not lied to men but to God. And then a few verses later, maybe two verses later, he says, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. So you can see he's, Peter makes a, a sort of a connection. You've lied to God, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's very close to an affirmation. It's very close to an explicit affirmation that the Holy Spirit is divine. Uh, what we find is in Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, the full revelation of the person of the Holy Spirit where uh, the, the apostles and the disciples are gathered together and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as tongues as a fire coming upon them and they go out and preach. So that's this full revelation uh, in the time of the church in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost of the Holy Spirit as a di distinct divine person. 
What we also find in the scriptures are what we can call Trinitarian formula, or uh, times when the three persons of the Trinity are named together almost in one breath. And one of the clearest is at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, Christ has died, he's risen, he's about to ascend, and he commissions his apostles. He sends them out to preach and to teach and to make disciples. And he says, he commands them to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we get kind of a Trinitarian formula there, uh, the, in the name, right, singular, the oneness, and then of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. With Father, Son, and Spirit mentioned all together in this formula, it's uh, uh, this kind of um, affirmation of this Trinitarian nature of God. And what's incredibly important in church history is that formula gets taken up in the actual process uh, or practice of baptizing. So the actual liturgical practice of baptizing includes this formula in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so when challenges arose to the Holy Spirit's divinity, one of the things a lot of the church fathers and these great bishops pointed to was the practice of baptism. They said, look, if the Holy Spirit isn't God, then why do we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? If the Father's God and you're baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son is God and you're baptized in the name of the Son, then if you're baptized in the name of the Holy Spirit, he too also must be God. So we see one of the important aspects here in the history of our church is the importance, the role of the liturgy or public worship played in uh, promoting and passing on sound doctrine. So there's a, um, a maxim in Latin, uh, lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of praying is the law of believing. And we see that in the early church, that the law of praying in the liturgy with baptism helped defend the law of believing or what we believed about the Trinitarian God. And so our liturgy is very important for handing on the truths of our faith. That's one thing when you're at Mass uh, or any public prayer of the church to listen to the prayers because the prayers communicate also to us what we believe and hand that on. Well, what ends up happening is with this challenge to the, to the divinity of the Holy Spirit is the pattern of the Council of Nicaea is followed. If there's this great challenge to the faith, there's a council called. And so we have the second ecumenical council or calling of the whole count, the council of the whole church. And that happens at Constantinople in the year 381. So we have the council of Constantinople in 381. And what that council does is it adds to the creed from Nicaea. It affirms that creed and then expands the portion on the Holy Spirit. It explicitly defines the divinity of the Holy Spirit. It's not that all of a sudden the Holy Spirit became God or the church had never believed it before, but in the face of challenge, the challenge was excluded and the truth was defined at this council in 381. And so that's in our creed where we now say uh, that the Holy Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, uh, that's another video, the Father and the Son, uh, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified uh, and has spoken through the prophets. That all comes from the Council of Constantinople. So the creed we profess at Mass, we may call it the Nicene Creed, uh, but that's really shorthand for the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. It's good we shorten it because that's a mouthful. So really our creed, this Nicene Creed, comes from the council the councils of the early church. And again, here's another important fac uh, facet of our Catholic faith is that the, the role of the church is incredibly important in protecting and uh, teaching the truth. That when it comes down to it, these challenges can't be settled by scripture alone. Uh, Arius and these other heretics 
were pointing to scripture. They were looking at the scriptures, the same scriptures that the Orthodox Catholic bishops were looking at, and coming up with different conclusions. And the same happens today. Different Christians look at the scriptures, the same scriptures, and come up with different interpretations. So who, whose interpretation do we follow? And if we look at the early church, and again, this is another video, it was of incredible importance in the early church that we look to the authority of the bishops that were uh, instituted as successors of the apostles. And we see historically when there were these major challenges in the early church, uh, these major questions about who is Christ and who is God as Trinity, those bishops gathered together in a council that spoke authoritatively for the church. So we have the scriptures, we have our sacred tradition, and that's undergirded or um, authentically and authoritatively interpreted by the teaching office of the church. And we see the pattern of this already laid in scripture, but practiced in the early church in the councils of Nicaea, the council of Constantinople, and then as we go on, these other further councils that will further uh, develop and define for us the, the doctrines of the divinity and humanity of Christ and the Trinity. So we've looked in these videos at uh, the, the importance of um, revelation in our understanding of the Trinity, that God has revealed this to us, the divinity of the Father, the divinity of the Son, now the divinity of the Holy Spirit. What we'll need to do in some upcoming videos is ask the question, how do we put these things together? And what we'll look at is, again, some of the ways that they don't go together. Uh, some of the things that are excluded. So in upcoming videos, we'll look at some ways that we can understand the Trinity through the lens of ways that we can't understand the Trinity. So stay tuned for that.